join me today as we go over five MRCP questions. These questions are all from MRCP Updates question banks. I think that, that getting the questions right on your MRCP exam, be it part one or part two, is more about reading the questions right and having the right clinical approach than just knowing the, the science. Um, picking up cues from the clinical history, from the investigations, from any clinical images provided, and reaching a differential diagnosis um, and looking at the choices to narrow down that differential to a uh, right answer um, is all about learning how to answer the questions right. Now, clinical decision making and clinical thinking um, I think is a very important skill to learn for your clinical practice and also for for passing your MRCP um, exams. So let's think out loud together as we solve these questions. Let's get into it. Question number one, a 38 year old woman with bipolar disorder presents to the GP. She complains of being thirsty all the time and going to the bathroom to pass urine many times a day. So these sound like diabetes symptoms, right? Either diabetes mellitus or insipidus. So let's keep on reading. Take some number of medications, lithium, tramadol, sleeping tablets. Now lithium should spark your interest because it's one of the causes of diabetes insipidus, right? Blood pressure 105 over 75 and general examination is unremarkable. Looking at the blood, she's a bit anemic. The rest of it, creatinine is a bit high. Now the osmolality is what we are interested in. The serum osmolality is high. 331. What does that mean? Simply it means that the, the, the blood, the serum in the blood is concentrated. Now that could be because um, the body's getting rid of a lot of water, secreting it through the urine, and that's um, making the, the serum more concentrated. Now we look at the urine osmolality and it's low. So it, it goes with our, with our suspicion. Um, the patient's passing a lot of dilute urine. So serum osmolality is high, urine osmolality is low. This goes with our suspicion of diabetes insipidus. A and B are both diabetes insipidus. Let's look at the other choices. C, psychogenic polydepsy is simply drinking a lot of water. So if you drink a lot of water, logically think about it. Um, what would that do? That would cause your serum osmolalities to actually drop because it, was di it would dilute the serum in the blood. So we can rule out C. Renal tubular acidosis type 1 and 4, both are going to lead to, um, to metabolic acidosis. In type 1, it's also associated with hypokalemia. The main mechanism is, is, is being the, the kidneys being unable to secrete hydrogen ions. So it retains the hydrogen ion, leading to a metabolic acidosis and hypokalemia. So potassium is normal, no metabolic acidosis, that's ruled out as well. E is body's resistance to aldosterone, so we would we would uh, expect an Addison-like picture of uh, of high potassium and low sodium, which again we don't see here, and there's no metabolic acidosis, so that's ruled out as well. So we're left with with A or B. Now cranial diabetes insipidus is is from um, a trauma to the brain. Now it could be something as simple as um, as a, a road traffic accident or any, any brain trauma or um, any radiation uh, causing a, a trauma to the hypothalamus. Now nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is a injury to the kidney uh, and from our clinical picture lithium is a nephrogenic, nephrotoxic medication so so from the choices nephrogenic diabetes insipidus makes the most sense and is the correct answer. So this is what I want to what I want to do with every question. We want to do some clinical reasoning and go through the choices together. Now, even if you don't know exactly uh, what the what the right answer is or exactly the the right information that you need, you can do a bit of elimination and reach the right um, answer. Our second question is a 33-year-old man who's taking azathioprine for Crohn's disease, presenting to ED with severe abdo pain and vomiting. Temperature is raised, blood pressure is low, heart rate is high, so this is a septic picture. Um, he has severe epigastric pain and bowel sounds are present. We see that hemoglobin is a bit low, white cells are raised, um, 
potassium is a bit low, creatinine is a bit raised, calcium is low, and amylase is high. So, hint from the history, he's taking azathioprine, right, which is one of the causes of acute pancreatitis, right, and we know that there is an infection from the clinical picture of sepsis. We know that there is an infection and the fact that he's taking azathioprine, so that would guide me towards an acute pancreatitis. Another guide is the hypocalcemia and the increased amylase levels, right? Both typical of pancreatitis. Now, this is important because even if you don't know all of the hints, if you know one of them or two of them, it could guide you towards the right answer. Looking at the choices, even if we just knew this is an infection, we know that it's not a small bowel obstruction. We can rule that out. Inflammatory markers are high and bowel sounds are present, so that rules it out. Cholecystitis and a viral gastroenteritis uh, would, in, would explain the raised inflammatory markers, but they wouldn't increase uh, explain the low calcium and the high amylase levels. The same with a Crohn's uh, flare-up. It wouldn't explain the the biochemical changes that are happening. Okay, so this confirms our diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. My my take-home tip for you here is that even if you pick up one or two of the of the of the clues in the question, it could guide you towards the right answer. Question number three, an 82-year-old man is being reviewed an ortho ward and a chest x-ray is performed. The patient also reportedly become confused. Now, what's the most likely diagnosis here? Lingular pneumonia, right lower lobe pneumonia, middle right lobe pneumonia, right sided pleural plaque, right upper lobe pneumonia. Now, let's look at the chest x-ray. We clearly see that there is a um, an an airspace shadow in the right lung. So just that information is going to get rid of two options for us. It's not a lingular pneumonia because the lingular is the equivalent of the of the right lobe on the left lung. This is in the right lung, so lingular pneumonia is out. It's not a right-sided pleural plaque because we see a clear airspace shadow that looks like a consolidation. Okay, so we're left with right upper, middle or lower lobe. Now, just knowing some basic anatomy is going to give us the answer straight away. We see this here is the horizontal fissure, right? And the consolidation is below the horizontal fissure. So that means that it's not the upper lobe. So the upper lobe is out of the picture. It's middle or lower lobe. Now, if it's a lower lobe consolidation, we would see haziness and opacification of the bases of the lung. But we see that the base of the lung is clear, so it's not a right lower lobe consolidation either. So we're left with right middle lobe consolidation, which is the correct answer. So, so clinical reasoning is very important. Basic knowledge and clinical reasoning. All right, question number four. A 74-year-old woman has Parkinson's for the past six years, comes to the neurology clinic, Wife is concerned that he's not taking his medication and believes he's being poisoned. He hit his wife on a few occasions and she, um, believes that she's trying to hurt him and believes there's people standing at the end of the bed talking about him despite attempts to optimize his medication. The delusions still persist. So um, there are delusions and agitation associated with Parkinson's. Now, how would we treat this patient's psychotic symptoms? Now, the clue here is to remember that, that typical antipsychotics are completely contraindicated, so we can't give haloperidol, right? That's out of the picture. Diazepam is also out of the picture because it could relieve the agitation, but it makes patients drowsy and with motor problems in Parkinson's, it's, it's really not ideal. So diazepam is out as well. Um, Donipazil is used for dementia. In patients with Lewy bodies, it actually does help with agitation as well, but but it hasn't really shown to have much benefit in Parkinson's. So we're left with the atypical antipsychotics, which we could use for Parkinson patients, risperidone or clozapine. Now, risperidone is not recommended. The two recommended anti atypical antipsychotic agents are clozapine and cutiapine. 
Uh, clozapine is one of the options, so we will go with A. So, take home tip here is that even if you didn't know that, you are able to eliminate haloperidol because it's contraindicated, diazepam because of sedation, and dunapazil because it's not really a treatment for psychosis. You're left with risperidone and clozapine. And then, even if you don't know that clozapine and quetiapine are preferred in Parkinson's, you can make an educated guess and it's, your odds would be down to 50-50. Final question. 72-year-old man is brought to ED after having suffered a stroke some 45 minutes earlier. He has right facial arm and leg weakness, expressive dysphasia, and difficulty swallowing. Hypertension, type 2 diabetes, blood pressure is 209 over 115 millimeters mercury. His heart rate is 105 and regular. Looking at his bloods, we don't find anything interesting. A CT head did not show any evidence of cerebral hemorrhage. Now, what's the most appropriate next step? This is a very, very typical MRCV question, and I specifically put this question to stress the importance of reading every detail. Now, this is clear that it is a stroke. It's within window uh, for throm thrombolysis, right? 45 minutes. It's not a wake-up stroke. Fills all the criteria, so you think, okay, so there's no hemorrhage, it's within window, let's give alteplase. Wrong. You can't give alteplase. The question is, what is the most appropriate next step? If it says what is the most appropriate um, ultimate management or what's the best management option for this patient, then it would be thrombolysis. But it's asking what's the next most appropriate step? Now, we can't give alteplase because the, the blood pressure needs to be under 185 over 110, and it's higher than that. So we need to give blood pressure control, which the first line is labetalol in stroke. Now, that IV labetalol is very controlled, and we can decrease the blood pressure to under uh, 185 over 110, and then we can give alteplase. Okay, um, that summarizes the five questions. I hope this was useful. If you did find it useful, do like the video and subscribe to the channel. Um, these questions were from MRCP Updates past papers. Um, if you are enjoying their style of questions um, and want to join, I've put a link in the description below. If you join through the link, you get 40% off both part one and part two. All right, guys, thank you for listening and leave me a comment for any suggestions uh, you might have and I will see you next time.